Barack Obama has pledged to close down Guantanamo Bay Prison and end its war crimes tribunals. His announcement was welcomed by human rights groups and protesters around the world who have campaigned to bring an end to the camp and its military tribunals. Once more than 700 men from over 40 different nations were crowded into metal mesh cells erected in rows along a Caribbean shore, but now less than 250 detainees remain. The facility still costs around $60 million a year and requires the attention of 2,200 soldiers and sailors. That works out to be nine guards per prisoner. Now that the Bush administration has been consigned to the history books, some are asking if the war on terror, as personified by Guantanamo, has cost America its moral authority in the world. Or is there growing optimism that the new man in the White House will signal the start of a new era where human rights come first? Today's agenda asks the question, Guantanamo, is it time to forgive and forget? Thousands of men and some women have been swept up in the tidal wave that was George W. Bush's war on terror. Many were released after a few days or weeks, but for some the ordeal lasted years, while others are still being held without charge or trial. And then there are those who've simply disappeared. The cages of Cuba opened seven years ago this month, and today's agenda, we bring together two sides to talk about one story. This show would have been inconceivable several years ago as my first guest served as a US guard. Chris Arendt is now out of uniform and has broken ranks to talk candidly about his experience. Moa Zambeg is probably the most famous prisoner to come out of Guantanamo because of his unstinting work to highlight the injustices there. He has also recounted his experience in the bestseller Enemy Combatant and is now a key member of the human rights group Cage Prisoner. Next to him is US-born Charlie Wolf, a strong supporter of the Bush administration and, as it happens, the only person sitting here today who has not been to Guantanamo. I went with filmmaker David Miller a few months ago to make a documentary for Press TV, which will be shown quite soon. And while we were filming inside, my final guest, Kateri-born Jarala Almari, was still being held. But let me start with you first, Moazan. Barack Obama has pledged to shut down Guantanamo. Surely that's the, the end of the matter now. Uh, I think the detention in Guantanamo Bay, according to even what uh, uh, Barack Obama has, has said, uh, will plague future administrations, not least uh, Obama's, particularly because even if what he says comes to pass, despite him beginning to seem to backtrack on the statements of, of wanting to close Guantanamo, that the issue isn't necessarily just Guantanamo, it's about detention without trial. And that is taking place, not just there, but it's taking place in Bagram, it's taking place in many other secret detention sites around the world, but it's also happening in the United States of America. Uh, and even uh, with, with Jarullah, I think it's extremely important that his brother's held in the United States of America as the only remaining enemy combatant who has not been charged with a crime uh, or tried and has been there since 2001. Well, let me go to Jarala. I mean, you were horrified at the title of this programme. Is it time to forgive and forget? Forgetting. <laughs> For six years and eight months to forget it like this, if you if you if you've been there, you will not forget it at all, because the torture is coming to us. Nobody's gonna forget it. I'm re I'm remembered every day, every night. What about forgive? Forgive to the the people to forgive us, like a Chris. He came and to tell people the truth what he did for us, and we called the other guards to do like the Chris did. This is okay. Now I'm with the Chris. We are nice together. But if he's if he's coming to me and he said, just he's not gonna forgive me. Uh, he's not gonna forget. Told me like forget, and he's not gonna forgive. It's not to make a sense. But uh, but Chris, I mean, you're all friends now. In fact, you're part of a national tour of the UK uh, with Cage Prisoner. 
But I mean, you were a, a Guantanamo uh, guard and uh, a pretty nasty one at times, weren't you? Uh, well, I mean, nasty in the structure of my own personal ethics and morals, but uh, you know, I, I mean, relatively, uh, I wouldn't say I was anywhere near as nasty as some others, but uh, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, didn't leave without having done a few things that were pretty ignorant. Do you see yourself as much as a victim as, say, Moazam and uh, Jarala? Um, I was asked this question last night, and uh, uh, cer first and foremost, certainly not. Um, I mean, I, in, a, in a sense, I see us all victims of this, the, the same thing, of, of the, the, I mean, the corporate intentions of this war, the pillaging that's occurred, the, the, we're, we're all victims of the Bush administration. Uh, I, I, um, I believe that we're all victims of uh, the, the class system and the structure of that that's, that's led us into the, these ordeals. And, uh, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a victim. I've made, I've made my decisions. I, I was trying to make out on the military with, with a few extra dollars and get some college money. And uh, I got busted and I got, I got sent to Guantanamo. Uh, I didn't want to go, but I'm, I, I wouldn't call myself a victim for that. Right. Charlie, um, all victims of the Bush administration. I mean, this is the administration that you, you admired. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would say victims of the Bush administration, but let's, you know, and I don't know individual cases, so it's hard to comment. But if, if anybody are victims, ultimately, I think they are victims of something much larger which, of course, is of groups like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban who supported them, who had created this war and necessitated Guantanamo. Uh, United States was, was attacked. It was a war not of their choosing, and they had to respond. And in a war, it is customary to detain people to take them off the battlefield. It is also uh, customary to question people. We had a situation here, as, as George Bush was talking himself in some of these uh, exit interviews, as he's called them in the last couple of days, he says, if you remember the situation of September the 11th, it, you know, now we look at it as it was one single event. In the middle of it, it didn't feel like that. We, we were waiting to see more events happening. This was a matter of saying, hold on, I've got people screaming at me, why didn't the administration connect the dots? Why didn't the previous administration connect the dots? So they had to connect the dots. And unfortunately, I think one of the problems in war or acts of terrorism is it is possible others get swept up in this. So if that's the case, uh, in your case or in your case, it is unfortunate. But at the same time, it is, it, it is part of that larger situation. Again, it is the problem of dealing with a group like Al-Qaeda and dealing with also the human rights of the 3,000 people that were killed and the potentially, what, 300 million Americans who could have also been attacked. And there were other planned attacks. And also, the information did work. We know in the case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that there were other plans. And they, they gained reams of information, of very useful information, that did help protect America and also help protect people here in London and in the wider in Europe. Uh, I think uh, I completely disagree, particularly on this issue of, of the, this whole attitude of detaining people without charge, without trial, introducing concepts would have redefined the means of torture in which people have been tortured, including Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, by waterboarding, something that has been outlawed uh, completely, something that was introduced during the Spanish Inquisition. And then the types of information that has been utilized and to, to force upon to the United Nations and to say that we have credible evidence that we have from Al-Qaeda captives, and I speak of the case of Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, in which they quoted that we have uh, credible evidence that he was working on obtaining weapons of mass destruction from Saddam, which turned out to be a complete lie. But based upon this lie, they invaded Iraq. And as a result of which, uh, millions of Iraqis or hundreds of thousands of Iraqis died, of which nobody tends to look at and say, in the name of the killing of 2,976 people on September the 11th, we have killed untold numbers of people in the Muslim world, and they simply are collateral damage.